it is critical for quality and validation professionals to stay on the pulse of emerging policies and regulations, from the FDA's computer software assurance draft to the newly released EU medical device general safety and performance guidance, evolving regulations are a constant. Our network of professionals cover these topics and more in print, in person, and online, bringing the latest industry news and tools to our audience of hardworking experts just like you. The IVT network gives you the tools you need to succeed in your profession, providing innovative content, industry research, lifelong learning, and opportunities for networking on a global level. For our listeners, receive 15 months for the price of 12 plus an exclusive discount with your new subscription. Subscribe today with IVT Network, the best decision you'll make all year for your life sciences career. This is Voices in Validation, brought to you by IVT Network. IVT Network is your expert source for life science regulatory knowledge. Voices in Validation brings you the best in validation and compliance topics. We interview industry experts from pharma, biotech, med devices, and laboratories. Here is the host of Voices in Validation, Stacy. Thank you, and welcome to another episode of Voices in Validation, brought to you by the IVT Network. We are excited to bring you ideas and concepts discussed at a recent panel presentation from the Computer Systems Validation Week conference. With some thought-provoking questions and reactive commentary from an industry expert, Valerie King-Bailey. Val, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for coming. Great to be here, Stacy. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this. Um, the recent session, Excellence and Next Generation Approaches to Quality Systems Monitoring, was intended to provide reflections on the current landscape, team challenges, and data governance programs and policies, understanding sources of bad data, missing data, data consistency, and data integrity, as well as speed of data delivery and defining metrics. Uh, all of that to help in establishing digitally enabled facilities using real-time analytics for agility in meeting ever-changing markets and leveraging predictive capabilities to ensure highest levels of quality and control. That was a mouthful. <laughs> Indeed it but, was. Absolutely. Um, and so that session was, you know, live, was presented live, but we're going to provide some clips here uh, for our listeners to listen to. And um, the first one here, let's take a listen. What types of data are being monitored and analyzed as part of the quality management system and in general, any quality risk? I'm you know, wondering, is this only typical quality data like audits, observations, or are we taking other types of data often used by the business functions? Yeah, I think the thing we're monitoring data, I, you know, what I'm looking for sometimes is, are we setting thresholds on data so we get alerts? Because sometimes it feels like in our industry, we're looking at data after it happened. But if it continues to happen, you know, we're not really, I'm noticing a real struggle where I've been at to set a threshold so you get an alert if you keep seeing this type of deviation or this type of kappa. So I think there's a lot of exciting technology coming out so we can get those alerts. So, you know, so we're, it's real time. So types of data and data sources. Uh, we, we heard the panelists refer um, to data sources. How will types of data and data sources advance the ways in which we are currently using our quality uh, monitoring systems? The way quality systems are used today is really to capture information um, almost retrospectively, but sometimes contemporaneously about quality processes. So whether we're talking CAPA, uh, non-conformances, temperature excursions, or any type of quality, what we're doing is we're capturing data um, that memorializes um, quality events. Um, what that means from a validation perspective is that we need a consistent and repeatable process as we collect it. But when we're looking at data, we want to make sure that the integration of data is there. So when you look at traditionally how quality stores were set up, um, you had a Kappa system in some cases, and this uh, really reflected my former employee uh, employer, but even some life sciences companies that I visit now. Um, 
the quality systems are somewhat in silos and they don't really speak together. But if you look at the International Conference on Harmonization, if you look at um, what organizations are doing like ISO, um, when they talk about quality processes, the need for integration of quality processes is really key. So let me give you an example. If I have a non-conformance, I should be able to link and bring in a kappa associated with that non-conformance. But I also, if it's critical, I should be able to have management controls associated with that kappa. So as we look at data, we want to make sure, and I think the future is to make sure that data Data is not siloed, that data is truly integrated to perform, uh, uh, to provide for organizations a bigger picture of the quality. If you step back and look at a 40,000 foot level of quality, what is the organization's responsibility from the standpoint of the regulator? The regulators are expecting organizations not only to achieve quality, uh, but to monitor quality processes over time. So organizations need to have a bird's eye view of how they're doing with quality, how we're trending, uh, whether we're trending upwards or downward, and how our data is interconnected. Because if I'm having a series of nonconformances and I'm raising a number of kappas for the same nonconformance, or you can look at any other cap or, or quality event, we need to have our data really reflect the real world to provide the ability for companies to make real-time uh, decisions based on actionable intelligence. Yeah, absolutely, Val. That is such a great point. Uh, integration is key. We have to break down the silos, you know, um, because that's the only way we're going to really be able to manage uh, our data in real time and across the entire life cycle, you know, effectively. That makes perfect sense, Stacey. Yeah. Um, this next clip we're going we're gonna to hear, they're going to talk a little bit about data confidence. Let's take a listen. Here's an area I think we're, we're really making some good progress with the data integrity initiatives where in the past we were not doing, taking our time to do data process maps quite as well as we're doing it now. We're really going in and saying, okay, we're even naming our data. What is master data and what is operational data, right? What is the master data, data about data, our workflows, our value lookups, and then how does that data, what's that life cycle of that data in that system, you know, from the creation, whether we archive it, destroy it. So we're really doing a good job, I feel, lately because of the data integrity initiatives and all the audit trail things. But again, I think it's the whole going out, what's the system, what were the operational controls around that data to protect the data in the system, the technical controls around it, the access controls, and what system did it come through? What, how can we tag it? Did it come from a validated GXP system? Did it come from a business operation system? How did it get into the warehouse or data mart? Do we take it directly out of the system? But again, you know, we're we're still seeing a lot of lack of understanding what phase that data is in. If it's approved, how long ago was it approved? Is it still true, right? Is there three of these approved? Because we've all done queries where we've shown up with the same data and we're like, well, which one do we pick? So that's where I think we really need to get a life cycle on this data. We're, we're, we're good at doing it for documents and things like this, right? We've been doing that for years. But when it's just pure raw data coming from our lab systems and stuff, we're really not doing a good life cycle job on that, right? We're not saying, where was this raw data used? Sometimes we'll pull it through the submission and the tables and things, but right at the beginning, we're not saying, where will this data be used? What life cycle is it in? What system did it come from? Things like that. So Valerie, what are your thoughts on these ideas on data integrity and the life cycle of the data? 
Yes. Uh, Data integrity is a super, super important point. Um, When you look at data integrity and, you know, there's sometimes a bit of confusion um, around data integrity in terms of what it means. Um, Data integrity really is how we put data into context and how we manage that context over a period of time. Um, It intersects with um, electronic records management because records management has a principle of data integrity associated so that as you manage um, the active life cycle of your information and data and manage active records, you want to make sure that that data um, uh, integrity uh, remains sound. Now, what do we mean when we talk about data integrity? Let's talk about documents for just a second. When we look at Uh, documents and the data integrity. Documents have the content and the associated metadata around the document. So let's say, for example, if I have a, a document and it's a standard operating procedure, and that standard operating procedure has metadata, including the author of the document, the date that the document was created, the signature details of the document, so on and so forth. The idea is that as that document migrates over time, maybe perhaps to different systems, we are able to keep the content and its associated metadata intact. Now, that sounds like a pretty easy concept, but it's more than a notion. Systems change. uh, Data stores change. uh, Document types change. And so as innovation moves forward, this is the challenge for life sciences companies. How do you maintain the context of the data associated with the specific content of the data? Um, And there are many other aspects of data integrity concerning the legal defensibility of electronic records that we maintain in our systems. Many of you already know this, but when we house um, electronic records, especially those that are governed by predicate rule requirements, um, those are legal electronic records and they have to be legally defensible. What do I mean by that? They are discoverable and those records could be subpoenaed in a court of law. And that means it, it is an added burden for data integrity because you must be able to um, ensure that records have not been tampered, um, that you know they haven't been compromised in some way to destroy the integrity of the record and to destroy really the context of the record in which it was created. Where this comes up most often is when we switch systems. So many of my life sciences clients are migrating to cloud-based systems from on-premise systems. As you move uh, from on-premise to the cloud, um, there are migration activities that take place. System A may not have the same attribute stores as system B. So we need to make sure that the context of those records as we move them forward remain intact and that data integrity principles and best practices are adhered to um, as we do that. There are many, many other aspects of data integrity, um, too numerous to go into now. But one of the things that I want to leave the uh, listeners with is understand the legal defensibility of electronic records and understand that the records that you're producing um, have a legal context associated with them. And that means that there has to be greater care to ensure the integrity of these records over time. Yeah, that's a great point. And because we are um, in, in a point in time where things are changing quickly due to different technologies and, as you mentioned, migration to the cloud. Yes. Um, it, it's just a, a, one more thing that they need to keep in mind, right? Exactly. Constantly. Yeah. Um, this next clip, we're going to hear a little bit more uh, from a panelist on her thoughts around the roles of the team. So let's take a listen. When we talk about the effectiveness of our pharmaceutical quality systems, um, you know, the effectiveness of our our PQS, 
very often what we're talking about is, you know, producing those metrics that we talked about earlier on and how many of these do we have? How many of those do we have? How many of those events are we reviewing? Um, as opposed to actually really looking at the um, uh, the effectiveness of our, of our decision making. So even though we have all these um, uh, business processes in, in place, um, uh, you know, like, you know, when we come to looking at the quality system monitoring, you may have a quality council or a quality review board that's meeting, you know, on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis. But are we really looking at the effectivity of the decision making that they're doing? Or is it just an update? Is it a briefing pack, you know, where they have to sit through 50 slides in a deck with all the, the dashboards and the charts? But what are they doing as a result of that? Is it driving either differences in the way in which we're running the business or is it driving um, enhancements and improvements in the way in which we're managing our, our quality management systems? Um, and sometimes I've, I feel there's a disconnect there. You know, we're checking the boxes. We're doing all the all the pieces. But again, we get back to that. Are we doing it because of compliance? Or are we really trying to build in effectiveness? Valerie, I just want to get your thoughts on what role does leadership play in establishing a proactive, action-oriented quality oversight process? I love this question because um, leadership is often uh, kind of, especially in technical circles, in the validation circle. Sometimes leadership is... um, I don't want to say diminish, but often not thought of or emphasized as much as it should be. Stacey, leadership plays an extremely important role. Um, Most quality management systems are governed from the top down. And why do I say that? Because of the fact that um, in order to facilitate a true quality management process. You need the buy-in to leadership uh, of leadership because they provide the resources, they provide um, the ability, they provide the time, they provide the emphasis to the organization. I can look at quality organizations and I could tell the impact of leadership by the behavior of the way people respond internally. For those organizations with strong leadership with respect to quality, procedures are respected. Um, Processes are in place and they're sound. Um, Documentation is sharpened uh, in those organizations because of the leadership of those organizations. Leaders also play an important role in the organization in terms of establishing the company's compliance posture. Um, And yes, organizations do have a compliant posture. Some organizations think of quality as eat your peas. Um, It is a necessary evil. You have to eat your peas and you have to deal with it. But some organizations rightfully consider compliance objectives as a legal best practice. And so instead of looking at it like I have to eat my peas and so I'll do the minimum amount as necessary, leadership says, I'm going to look at the spirit of the regulation, which is to drive patient health and safety. And I am going to put in procedures and best practices to ensure the consistency and the repeatability of my uh, compliance processes. Here's another thing that good leaders do. They understand the benefit of automation. I've been in this industry since 1981 and going all the way back to the 80s, compliance and automation of the compliance process was considered a luxury and not a necessity. Today's forward-thinking leaders understand different. They say compliance is an imperative, but automation is going to drive my business. And so instead of looking at compliance in terms of necessarily dollars and cents, and I don't mean that true leaders will not look at the economics of it, they certainly will. But they will also look at the benefits which far outweigh um, the economic benefits. They understand that the return on investment for automation 
is greater. So when you look at the impact of leadership, leadership really drives the the way the companies look at compliance. The eat your peas versus legal best practice is critical. And today's forward-thinking leaders recognize that as the um, software technology industry innovates and they bring automation to the table, in the form of robotics process automation, in the form of cloud technologies that accelerate quality and compliance processes, um, in terms of uh, artificial intelligence that are driving certain compliance processes, they realize now automation is not a luxury anymore it is a necessity. If you want to speed new products to market faster, the way you do that is through automation. And true leaders actually understand that. Yeah, I totally would agree. And I and I I uh, love that you mentioned how you can tell what a leader's style is or what kind of leader they are by interacting with the team. Yes. Because I think they're so... Uh, important in building that culture, you know, the culture of compliance, the culture of risk, and just the overall um, team spirit uh, through their actions as a leader. Um, and, and, and then, of course, they have to provide oversight for the organization and uh, keep their thumb on innovation and et cetera. But I, I, it's the whole culture piece that I think um, is the underlying thread here. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I also love that you talked about automation. Um, This next clip we're going to hear is talking about automated testing. Uh, And then I have a few follow up questions. So let's take a listen. We're trying our best. We're we're all in the cloud. We're using SaaS solutions and we're using an old time way of validating and keeping up with the forced releases. I am still looking at how do we do regression testing for high functionality, high risk functionality for SaaS solutions. A lot of the time we're we're going in and we're doing a great job validating, but we're not really saying, okay, here's our functional risk assessment. Here's our 12 functions that during every upgrade or every release, force release, we're just going to run them through automatic. Just hit the button, have an automated test. That way we don't have to sit and, you know, worry about did the forced release break anything in our high functionality. It appears that we might be doing a lot of like paperless validation and going online, but we really haven't gotten to that sweet spot of really automating, really automating the things. Some of us are doing it, but I don't see it as part of the kickoff. I don't ever see it built in right away as part of that project plan. Where is the creation of automated automated test scripts for regression testing? Just right away. Where are they at? Why aren't they being built at the beginning? Because right now our technology and whether we like it or not is going to be updated all the time. It's going to be real time. We're going to get SaaS solutions. I mean, if you look at even things I talked about, Snowflake, right? Every 30 days, they're going to push, right? Some changes. Viva, we've all lived the Viva, right? We've all lived that, the quarterly releases and things like that. And I think sometimes we do our little risk assessment and we say, nope, it's not going to affect it. But we really don't have any automated tests just to push and run our workflows through and say, okay, for this fall release, we just automate automatically tested our high functionality. We're done. But um, we're falling behind. And I don't know if it's a trust level, because like I just came off of cell manufacturing, and we had to automate all those processes to enable capacity, right? Because each batch record is a is one person, right for their cells. So I don't know in our industry, if we're not trusting the automated tools, or it's the skill set uh, that we're learning how to use automated tools for testing. I, I'm just not sure the slow adoption, I'm seeing a lot more people and I'm I'm hoping we all as an industry push it more and more. And with the new CSA coming out, a lot of informal testing would be a great opportunity for automation. But yeah, we're slow. We're really slow. We're still, we still like our paper. We still like writing as expected. I don't know why we love that, but you know, we still, we have all these little behaviors we feel comfortable with, but I, I think we won't be able to keep up with all the SaaS solutions until we, and not all systems should have an automated test, but, you know, our high risk ones and our, our workflows, you know, on our safety systems, things like that, 
we should be investing in automated testing right at the beginning. Right. Valerie, where do you think we are in terms of adoption of automated testing and and how does that compare to automation for production? Uh, Great question, Stacey. Where we are with respect to automation, and this is interesting because I'm going to put the answer pre-COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. I've been experiencing a rapid surge in the adoption of advanced technology for validation. Let me explain. Pre-COVID, adoption of technology to support the validation testing process um, was kind of steady, um, but it wasn't growing at a rapid clip. Organizations were beginning to say, you know what, as we're adopting uh, advanced technologies, um, cloud technologies, artificial intelligence, we're implementing uh, complex systems such as enterprise resource planning, um, we're recognizing the need um, to be able to quickly develop uh, test cases and that kind of thing. And pre-COVID, that was kind of moving along at kind of what I would call a steady pace. Mm -hmm. After COVID hit, and many of us were separated from our offices, and the FDA came out with their new software assurance methodology that focused more on ad hoc testing and rigorous software testing versus um, the traditional document-centric approach to validation, things changed. So two things that I want to kind of hone in on that are kind of game changers for automation and testing. Let's talk about the FDA for a second. The FDA did an analysis of several companies and they were looking at validation packages that these companies were producing. And the the idea was to look at these companies to see how they were focusing on their validation efforts? Were they accurately and rigorously testing these applications to ensure that the systems were suitable for intended use? Hmm. Well, the short answer is what the FDA found is that many life sciences companies were more rigidly focused on developing the documentation and a lot less focused on critical thinking and looking at whether or not we're rigorously testing the software. So traditionally, I go all the way back to the early 80s with respect to validation. Traditionally, validation engineers have been kind of programmed over time to kind of fear the validation process. Oh, the FDA is going to come in and they're going to swoop down and they're going to shut your organization down or (laughs) we're going to get caught in something. So there was a natural tendency to focus on the documents. Well, the FDA came along um, about a year and a half ago and they actually changed the name from validation to software assurance. What were they getting at? As software is being incorporated in medical devices, as well as desktop and enterprise software, the FDA's mission hasn't changed. They're still concerned about public health and safety. So what the FDA said is... We want a more focus on critical thinking. We want these companies to look at software testing as a legal best practice. We want you to rigorously test your applications. Now, why weren't companies doing that to begin with? Well, because they felt like if I have to write down every single test, this is cost prohibitive and time consuming, and it stops me from adopting advanced technology. So what the FDA came back and said is, fine, you don't have to write every test down, but I do want you to rigorously test the application using ad hoc testing, and I want you to tell me how that went. I don't need you to write down step by step by step every single thing you did, but I do want you to rigorously test the software. So it it unshackled the industry in a profound way because the agency is still expecting some testing to be documented, but not quite 
um, the documentation that we would have expected back in the 90s, let's say, or the early 2000s. So this is a profound change, and it's one that industry should embrace. Now, the FDA wasn't prescriptive in terms of how they felt software assurance should be implemented in companies. They're giving companies the flexibility. And this is the thing that industry should embrace. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, and please. it does come back to that critical thinking, right? Like, understand exactly. why you're doing certain things in your organization and uh, test appropriately. You don't have yeah. to, you know, test everything to the same level. You need to understand where your risk is and what your highest priorities are and use the knowledge you have. That is exactly right. And then when you talk about what happened after COVID, there's been a profound change in the workplace. And it doesn't only affect validation engineers, it affects every single industry in high tech. Here are a few things that people started to notice when they're out of the office capturing of wet signatures. Many organizations didn't adopt advanced technology because they were already in the office. They loved their paper. So what they would do is use Microsoft Word to generate the paper. They would print the paper on hard copy and they would walk it around the office and get wet signatures. And that worked. That's what I call 20th century validation. 21st century validation says export that document from your automated system, route around using electronic uh, signatures, reduce your document cycle time, save your company money, and use automated approaches. Well, Stacey, that's exactly what happened post-COVID. Oh, yeah. We digitized quickly, didn't we? (laughs) We digitized very quickly. So many of my clients, and I'm sure across the globe this is true, many of my clients are saying, we need a more automated validation process. We need an end-to-end process. So people have been talking about paperless document processes since the beginning. I used to work for Documentum, and we were talking paperless validation in 19, or paperless processes, including validation in 1991. Uh, so this goes all the way back to the late 80s, early 90s, where paperless processes were talk, uh, talked about. But you have to ask yourself, why hasn't it really truly become a reality? Because for many of my clients, they still use an automated system to generate uh, 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 documentation, but they still print the paper out in hard copy format. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but you need to look at what is the official copy and what is a printed, uncontrolled hard copy of the document. So after COVID, many organizations started to look at automation as something that they should embrace. And we're seeing a surge in in my practice um, in terms of automation. And I'm sure this is a global phenomenon post-COVID. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's only taken us a global pandemic to embrace a 30-year-old concept, (laughs) Valerie. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, Stacey, that is priceless because that is exactly what has happened. But we are now here, thank goodness. We are, we are. Uh, Valerie, I want to see if you can expand a little bit more and talk about how we can balance automated test scripts versus the ad hoc modern testing approaches being highlighted in the pending Uh, CSA guidance? Yes. um, Great question, um, uh, Stacey. And uh, this is one that's kind of near and dear to my heart. When we validate, and, and this has been a practice with me for years, when we validate a system, we typically do a bit of ad hoc testing after the development phase of the project is over. So we get the uh, software from the developer. There is typically a code freeze uh, process there. And we start to conduct a bit of ad hoc testing. Now, our system, Validation Master, is really, really good good for this because it allows you to do ad hoc testing initially, and you can mark the testing in the system as your ad hoc testing, and it allows you to even automate the capture of ad hoc testing. And then when you go to your official test, it allows you to do official testing. This is really important for a couple of reasons, because the burden 
of the validation engineer to capture and record every single thing that's going on um, is removed. And the, the validation team gets to summarize the testing. So testing tools need to have the ability to allow uh, test engineers to actually summarize the test. And we, can, we have uh, graphs in our system that show the percentage passed, the percentage failed, and what we believe the quality of the software is. So for the first time, we have metrics that are associated with ad hoc testing. This is kind of what the FDA was getting at when they talked about software assurance. They don't necessarily want you to go through um, the uh, paper-based rigor of actually writing every single thing down, but they do want to know how the ad hoc testing went. So um, did you pass? What is the percentage of pass fail? Let me give you an example, Stacy. Let's say that you were testing a big ERP system and this ERP system, you know, had many, many requirements associated with it. And I started to do my ad hoc testing. Did 50% of the test scripts pass, 30% of the test scripts pass, 5% of the test scripts pass? Hopefully not. Uh, but, you know, how many of your test scripts passed? Um, what is the nature of the issues? Were they critical issues that you were encountered or were these minor issues that you encountered? For example, a form has a typo on it. That's a minor issue. A major issue would be something like the system blue screened. That's a problem. That's critical. Um, right. Having the ability to be able to capture information about your testing in an ad hoc way so that it doesn't burden the validation engineer. And I think this is where the FDA was going with the whole notion of um, ad hoc testing. They wanted to remove the burden, but they wanted the companies to do it. And here's the bottom line. If you make it easy for companies to conduct testing, companies will do it hands down. If you make it so difficult that organizations feel that this is time consuming, it's not value add. And this is another thing in the software assurance uh, arena that the FDA presented. They talked about what is the value of this testing to your company. And one of the things that I think they said, which was most profound, they want organizations to look at testing and what what is important for that specific company to test? So if you make catheters, for example, you want to test all of the risk-based processes around the catheter itself. So the FDA is expecting you to laser focus on that, maybe not so much on search and retrieval of data, even, that, even though that's important, but it's kind of an ancillary process. They want you to focus on catheters. If you make pharmaceuticals, they want you to focus on the potency aspect of this. They want you to focus on on the warehouse management of it. If your drug, like a Moderna, for example, which is a cold chain process, um, that is critical for that drug to be delivered in the at the temperature that it's supposed to be, what the agency is asking companies to do is focus on that. They want you to focus on the things that could potentially cause you to produce adulterated product or deliver adulterated product to your customer. Now, this gives everyone their marching orders, so to speak. What should we be focused on? And for the validation engineers listening to this, this is not new because we've been doing risk-based validation forever. But what right. we haven't been doing is focusing on value uh, necessarily because many validation engineers, and I talk to them every day of the week, their feature function, feature function, feature function, they're testing the features and the functions, but they are missing the elephant in the room, which is what the agency is asking you to do. They're asking you to focus on value. Let me say one other thing. That is the elephant in the room for life sciences. Listen up. We are seeing a lot of ransomware attacks on major companies, and we're seeing a lot of cyber events. Onshore invented something called a cybersecurity qualification. 
So many of you have heard of an installation qualification, operational qualification, performance qualification. One additional qualification that we do is a cybersecurity qualification. How ready is your firm to protect your systems, detect um, intrusions, respond and recover to cyber events. If you don't know this and you're validating systems, that's problematic. So in addition to looking at all of the different things that we traditionally do, I'm going to leave you with two things. Number one, you should be considering in your validation lifecycle testing cybersecurity qualification. And it is an assessment of your readiness to protect, detect, respond, and defend and recover from a cyber event. That's number one. And number two, what you should be looking at as you go through this, you should be looking at automation and how you can basically uh, bring your automation into more maturity. Look at those areas of your um, processes that have the greatest impact. Embrace the software assurance methodology and look at those areas that are the riskiest. Do your ad hoc testing and then do your formal testing. Absolutely. And thank you. I, I'm so glad that you mentioned the cybersecurity qualification because obviously, as we have you know rapidly digitized, we are all working in or most of us have been working in and from uh, remote locations. And of course, we have seen an uptick in Absolutely. the number of um, online cyber events, right? And um, this is something that you may have the best systems in place as an organization, but if you're using vendors, which many of us are, you know, that's another way in for some of these um, cyber criminals. So uh, I think it's really important that you are mentioning that you need to assess your risk, you know, on that scale as well. Absolutely. Our cybersecurity qualification is a part of our validation process. We believe that we need to get out of the 20th century validation processes and move into 21st century. Cyber events are real events, and they could affect the smallest life sciences company um, to the smallest biotech to the largest pharma company. We need to make sure that not our, our systems are not only installation, operational, and performance qualified. We need to make sure that they're cybersecurity qualified. And I talk about this as being the elephant in the room. If you think of the definition of validation, written confirmation that a system performs according to its intended use. How could you not look at cybersecurity right. as no, one I, of the issues? Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Uh, this is, I have one more clip I want uh, our listeners to hear. Uh, and the panelists is talking about automated testing uh, and the burdens of validation, as well as um, software vendors and, and other tools. So let's take a listen. I think we're, you know, other industries have used these standard automated testing tools like Tosca, whatever, for years and years for, you know, automated hospital equipment that does surgery. They're using this tool to automate testing. And I think that we have to, again, look at the risk level of the software vendor. How long has it been being used for automated testing? And I, I do agree that we're holding it to too high of a rigor, especially these tools that have been around 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. But again, it's also about the skill set of the person writing the automated test, right? That needs to be looked at too. But if we did that at the beginning of any sort of system implementation, you could almost really qualify this tool as part of that implementation of that other system because you could concurrently do some manual testing, right? And then run your automated test and show, you know, they're consistent. So yeah, I think a lot of um, companies are saying it's too heavy of a lift to really qualify this automated testing tool and use it. And we got to get over that, in my opinion, because these tools have been out there for 20 years. Valerie, is slow adoption of automated testing due to the burdens of validation, as the panelists mentioned here? 
Yes, it, it is. And I talked about that a little bit uh, earlier. Yeah. When you, when you look at um, the reason why a lot of organizations don't do the rigorous testing that the agency is suggesting that they do, um, there are two elements that always come up during this discussion, time and money. Mm-hmm. When organizations are adopting advanced technology, time is of the essence. Many of these organizations, especially the IT uh, um, uh, departments within these organizations, they want to get the systems up as quickly as possible. And that means they want to streamline and optimize the validation process. Um What is holding a lot of organizations back is the documentation burden. So when you look at software assurance and you look at what the agency is doing, what they're doing to a certain extent is attempting to unshackle these organizations. But at the same time, they are recognizing that the more advanced technology becomes and the more integrated these technologies become, the riskier they become. And this is where the agency is coming from. Let me give you a classic example. If you look at Microsoft Dynamics 365, which is an enterprise resource planning system that has a number of different components, there's an app store that's connected to D365. So right within the uh, architecture of the system, you can actually purchase apps online to integrate with the system. Well, if you think about it, the apps can come from other vendors that may not be qualified. And so now I'm taking an unqualified vendor and bringing it into my ERP system, which brings my validation due diligence actually up a bit. The uh, D365 architecture also includes a mobile component. Every single ERP system out there has a mobility component. So when you add, in in the old days when we used to do software, it was just desktop and it was just client server and we didn't have mobility, we didn't have cameras and all of these fancy things that we can add. But mobile devices actually can transmit data into an application. So now my validation due diligence is increased because I need to actually confirm that I got, you know, good data coming into my application from the mobile devices consistently and repeatedly. So as you look at the vendor community, vendors are getting much more sophisticated. And what they're attempting to do is they're attempting to bring these applications together in a meaningful way so that organizations don't have to individually do all of the integration themselves. In the olden days, about 10 years, ago. Um, If you wanted mobility integrated with your application, you had to build it in. If you wanted, you know, uh, third-party apps, you had to integrate them to a certain extent. Um, Microsoft has been one of the companies um, that has, you know, kind of the ubiquitous architecture where you can basically integrate any type of architecture. They're even taking Microsoft Teams to a different level where Teams is now being able to be integrated into life sciences application. All of these things um, bring unique challenges to the validation community. So how you look at um, the vendors and what the vendors are actually offering and the impact on compliance objectives and uh, expert systems that life sciences companies are using, all of this is going to become super important as you look at that. So this is one of the things that we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's a there's a level of complexity to validation that wasn't there, um, you know, a, a couple of decades ago because of all of these technologies uh, and the integration. And you mentioned vendors, uh, and we're all relying on vendors certainly um, for different aspects of our day to day activities. Can should we be relying more heavily on software vendors uh, for some of these? Um, burdens of validation? Yes, um, you should be. Um, One of the things that's happening right now, and even more at a rapid pace, if you would ask me 15 years ago, how many 
cloud-based clients uh, do you have? How many clients are using cloud-based technologies? I would say um, very few of them because back 15 years ago, people were still um, using on-premise technology. That's pretty much gone away. The vendor community has matured. Are they fully there yet? No. Um, all life sciences vendors are not created equally. So for example, when you look at cloud vendors, um, you need to look at cloud vendors um, where their platform has been qualified. Um, the platform has been uh, audited uh, by third-party organizations. So yeah, I'm going to pick on Microsoft again. Take Microsoft. Microsoft has a trust center, www.microsoft.com forward slash trust center. In this trust center, Microsoft is audited by Deloitte, the big accounting firm. Mm -hmm. Microsoft publishes all of their audit reports online. So you can now see all of this information online where the auditor has gone in and they said either Microsoft does or doesn't comply uh, with this cloud control or that cloud control. So you need to make sure that your vendors are qualified if you're going to be relying on them because your vendors need to kind of do the same things that you're doing. So Microsoft does have a change control procedure behind the scenes and because of the fact that they change their software on a monthly cadence, this is another thing that's kind of giving some life sciences companies heartburn. Every time a system changes, there is a validation activity that has to go on with that. Okay. So Microsoft, um, each year, twice a year, they only release major software in April and, and uh, October. Um, so organizations, they allow you to skip certain releases, three releases specifically, so that your validation effort is only twice a year and not 12 times a year. And this is absolutely huge. Now, one of the other things that people worried about back 15 years ago when they were looking at cloud, and this was one of the main reasons why they didn't adopt the cloud, is change control. Having visibility to changes that are happening in the system. Well, Microsoft in their trust center, they publish the changes to the Azure platform, the changes to D365. You can look at every single change that they made to the system, assess those changes, do an impact assessment on those changes and move forward. So the software vendor community and Microsoft isn't the only one. Oracle has similar uh, features uh, to, their, uh, to that SAP uh, is in the life sciences sector and so forth. But um, Microsoft probably out of the three vendors has done the best job of this because um, they uh, publish a lot of information and it's very transparent, very easy to get to. Um, and they don't make you write to the company or anything like that to get the information. But this is, um, you know, really kind of the changing paradigm of vendors. I remember when I used to work for Abbott Laboratories and I called Microsoft. This was back in the 90s. And I asked them about uh, the transparency and would they um, be participating in an audit. And the legal department replied, we make no warranties express or implied, um, meaning that they're not going to participate in an audit and um, they're not going to provide any further information that was available, uh, wasn't available in the public domain. So when you look at these companies, this is really, uh, you know, the maturity of um, the software vendor community and the vendor community now more than ever is more in tune to what life sciences companies specifically are looking for. And many of them, including Onshore, has built in functionality to support life sciences uh, uh, compliance mandates, even GDPR and other mandates uh, for Sarbanes-Oxley and things like that, into um, the software, um, That whereas before, um, there was some of this, but not to the extent that it is now. So yes, you should be reliant more on vendor communities, but at the same time, hold your vendor's feet to the fire. Yeah, for sure. Because, you know, as an organization, uh, we are the ones that are ultimately responsible 
Um, so you need to make sure that uh, you understand the information your vendors are putting out there and leveraging that knowledge, but you still need to make sure that it uh, works for you in your systems and protocols. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's one piece where I see some uh, organizations get tripped up. You know, they think, well, the vendor said it was a validated, you know, product that the software yeah. was already validated. It's like, yes, but you still have to make sure it fits in and does what you intend it to do in your organization. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And beware of validation out of the box. Um, because typically validation out of the box only covers a percentage of what you're doing. Understand that the vendor can only validate those out of the box features, but every single company takes a software application, configures it for their own use and makes it their own. So you can use uh, test scripts that the vendor provides as a starting point. Right. And even the um, FDA's current validation guidelines say you can use that as a starting point, but do your own due diligence to prove that the system does what you need it to do. And that's really a very important point. Doesn't mean that you can't leverage the vendor uh, application and the FDA even says that, but they say, don't just say, okay, the vendor gave me these scripts yeah. and they said it was okay. So that's why I use the system. You're going to have to show the agency that you did a bit more due diligence to prove that that application meets your objectives. Exactly, exactly. So Valerie, obviously, you know, we are relying more and more on vendors um, and they are an important uh, part of what we're doing in um, life sciences uh, these days. But what other tools um, would make automated testing and or validation activities easier and more efficient? That, that's a great question. Um, all automated tools are not created equal because not all software applications are created equal. So there are differences in the way web applications are built. Some have uh, dynamic HTML, uh, some have other uh, uh, HTML or other code in them. Um, that may or may not be recognized by the automated tool. There are several um, automation tools out there uh, to help you manage applications. So one of the first things you need to do um, when you're looking for a tool is look at the type of application it is and, you know, uh, get a little bit more of a feel for mm -hmm. how that tool is built. Now, there are some tools and one that I use commonly in my practice is a tool called Ranarex. And uh, Ranarex, many of your uh, listeners may know this tool. It integrates with our validation master system um, to provide fully automated testing. And what this tool actually does is it recognizes multiple structures of applications. So as I've looked at the different tools on the market, and I've pretty much seen them all, um, when you look at certain tools, certain tools are good for certain things. And um, I find some tools that are good for this application, but don't work on this application. For example, Microsoft dynamically generates their forms. So um, when you look at uh, certain tools that are on the market, they don't really capture Microsoft uh, features because of the way Microsoft tools actually, uh, or Microsoft software is actually designed. So make sure that the tool fits um, whatever application you're using. There are certain tools out there for performance qualification, um, for unit testing, for ad hoc testing, and uh, for enterprise software testing and cloud testing. One of the things that um, is coming up um, that we're going to be adding um, very shortly to our tool set is we're going to be adding artificial intelligence to our tool set um, to ensure that we move from the old traditional way that we're capturing test scripts um, to a more automated approach. Why are we doing that? Because um, 
if you think about the cadence that cloud vendors are releasing their software, I mentioned Microsoft releases software on a monthly basis, um, Oracle Fusion Cloud, um, SAP, and their, you know, for HANA. Mm -hmm. um, uh, many of these systems are being released. And I don't mean to just talk about ERP systems, because if you look at Viva for content management, or if you look at Pilgrim systems or Master Control for quality management, all of these systems have kind of the same characteristics about them. They're changing their software on a more frequent basis. The more frequently software changes, the more readily you have to adopt. I have one client who's using um, our validation master system, for example, and uh, they have 400 test scripts that they've written for a specific application. Whenever that application comes out with a new release, um, they use our fully automated testing. So they literally specify at midnight on such and such a date, go out, interrogate the software, run these test scripts and bring the reports back to me. And Validation Master will tell them which ones pass, which ones fail, and they can see quickly where the landmines are. That's the future of validation, where I can test an application very quickly. Um, typically, to run those 400 test scripts would take about a week. Um, to run them in Validation Master takes the better part of about three or four hours uh, to run them. So they can get rapid response about the quality of an application, saving them time and money. That's the future, Stacy, of where vendors are going. Uh, with these applications. For sure. And it frees up your re other, your resources, your human resources for more critical thinking activities Absolutely. and things that we can't automate, right? Absolutely. Creativity. <laughs> <laughs> what a novel concept. Innovation. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Valerie, I thank you uh, for all of this uh, information and for sharing your thoughts on um, on the clips that we provided here from this last session. And before we get ready to uh, wrap up. I just want to ask if there are any last thoughts on either this session uh, delivered during CSV or on the comments that uh, you provided here already. Yeah, one thing, uh, one last thing that I would like to leave your listeners with um, um, regarding automation is automation today is a necessity and not a luxury. In the era of COVID, um, it is now more important more than ever for organizations to really begin to embrace and adopt advanced technology um, to fuel not only their validation processes, but other processes as well. Um, the time is out for uh, companies to be looking at um, compliance as an eat your peas proposition and to look at it as a way to accelerate not only compliance and uh, quality, but to ensure sustained compliance over time. Um, innovation is coming at us at the speed of thought, and we need to be able to respond. So as organizations mature in their thinking of software assurance and validation, they need to mature in terms of leveraging advanced technology to go from a level one validation organization to a level five validation organization where you're fully matured, your processes are uh, documented, and your systems are automated to deliver a single source of truth for validation. That was a great way uh, to, to end this discussion, Val. I appreciate it so much. All right, Stacey. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And Thank thanks you. for having me. And of course, this panel discussion is just a snapshot in time and reflects only a limited view of the topic. All panelist opinions are their own and provides a jumping off point for future discussion. We would again like to thank today's guest, Valerie King-Bailey, CEO of Onshore Technologies, for sharing her knowledge and expertise and weighing in on the next generation approaches to quality systems monitoring discussion. Also, a big shout out to our producer, Ben Kitchen, for all of his time in editing these sessions. Lastly, thank you to you, our valued listeners. We want to hear your thoughts and questions on this topic. Help us continue the discussion by sharing this with your online networks. Also, please remember to subscribe in your podcast player of choice 
so you never miss an episode. This week, we are offering an exclusive download of the entire Excellence and Next Generation Approaches to Quality Systems Monitoring and Analysis Perspectives and Innovation Session free for our listeners. Simply visit www.ivtnetwork.com backslash podcast to download and listen. Please email your questions and comments to customer service, ivtnetwork.com. We'll be back again next week with another insightful episode. Until then, make it a great week.